if there are two important things to take away from, from the work that you're doing, both on this checkup as well as what we want to take away from the checkup and move forward uh, to working with later on in the hour, um, I would say it's going to be the answers to these two questions, um, which we'll get to secondly after we look at the checkup questions. The first is, if I have a unit vector, let's say V is a unit vector, then how do I project uh, onto the span of that unit vector? In other words, if I just have a one-dimensional subspace with a unit vector as, as the basis, then how do I project onto that uh, subspace? And then if I just broaden that out a little bit and I have an orthonormal basis for a higher dimensional subspace, then how do I de determine the projection of a vector onto the span of that orthonormal set? So let's start just by checking in on your uh, checkup questions. First of all, if I have a set of two vectors, v1, v2, then what does it mean for that set to be orthonormal? What did you write? Oh, v1 and v2 are unit vectors. Okay, so that covers the normal part of this. Normal means that v1 and v2 have to be unit vectors. Uh, how does that look in sort of equation format? What's the definition of a unit vector? They both have a magnitude of one. They both have a magnitude of one. And how do we get to magnitude using the tools of our course? How, how would we write the equation both have magnitude 1? What has to equal 1 here? Say again. The square root of the sum of the squares, but how do we get the sum of the squares out of the matrix operations that we've been using in our course? It's important to get used to the notation that we've been using. So how do we express the length of a vector let's say the length of V1, using the matrix operations that we've been working with in our course. How do we get at it? The dot product of the vector with itself. So we could write it as V1 dot V1, but we haven't really used the dot so much to represent our dot products. That we would do in a vector calculus course. Instead, how do we use matrix multiplication to achieve the same goal? Yeah, where do I want to put the transpose here? V1 transpose times V1. Perfect. Great. So <clears throat> the normal part in orthonormal is that our vectors have to be unit vectors, namely that if we dot them with themselves or said in the language of matrix multiplication, if we multiply each vector by its own transpose, V1 transpose V1 and V2 transpose V2, we'll get 1. Technically, we should have a square root on that. But because 1 squared is equal to 1, we can just forget about the square root if it makes us feel better. And personally, forgetting about square roots always makes me feel better. I don't know about you. Um, so that covers the normal part of orthonormal. We need V1 transpose V1 and V2 transpose V2 to both be equal to 1. So what about the ortho part in orthonormal? What else has to be true? V1 and V2 have to be orthogonal. So I might write V1 as perpendicular to V2 like this. And how does that express itself in an equation? Dot product V1 dot V2 0. Yeah. So if I dot these vectors with one another, I should get 0. And when I dot them with themselves, I should get 1. 0 and 1 being the simplest numbers to work with in the entire real number system, one would expect that working with a basis which is an orthonormal set uh, will make a lot of our computations much, much simpler because they're going to involve numbers like 0 and 1 as opposed to whatever else these dot products may turn out to be in a more general situation. For example, if we look in question 2 at this pair of vectors, let's call them v1 and v2 just for the sake of convenience. So v1 is 3, negative 3, 4, 0, v2 is 1, 2, 2. Um, we can verify that this is definitely not an orthonormal set because if I, for instance, take V1 transpose V2, I'm going to get negative 3 times 1 plus 4 times 2 plus 0 times 2. So the dot product with one another is equal to 5. <coughs> so definitely not 0. So these vectors are not orthogonal. And it's also true that they're not unit vectors. Because what is V1 transpose V1 for this vector V1? It's, that's, well, until I take the square root, it's 25. But yeah, it's actual length. If I take the square root of that, I get 5. V2 transpose V2? 9. <coughs> Nine. So neither of our vectors have unit length. 
So this fails on sort of all counts of trying to be an orthonormal set. <coughs> they're not orthogonal to one another, and they're not unit vectors. And so the Gram-Schmidt procedure is a way to make that happen, to take any old basis for a subspace and boil it down to a basis which is orthonormal. After all, we need to know as mathematicians that we can unlock the power that orthonormality is going to give us in any given situation. Um, the big couple of the big theorems of today are that we can always find an orthonormal basis for any subspace that we would want to find a basis for <coughs> because the Gram-Schmidt procedure exists and because it always works. If we begin with a linearly independent set, the Gram-Schmidt procedure gives us an orthonormal set that has the same span as the original. So we're still describing the same subspace, we're just doing it using orthonormal vectors instead of a set which may not be orthonormal. Um, and because we know that orthonormal bases exist, then everything that we can prove about them is something that we can use for any subspace at all. We just have to go through the process of actually discovering that orthonormal basis first. Now, how does the Gram-Schmidt procedure work? How do I take this set, V1, V2, and from it discover a new set which has the same span, so it spans the same subspace as V1 and V2 do, um, but which is orthonormal instead of, well, not orthonormal. So how do we do it? How does Gram-Schmidt work here? So in the Gram-Schmidt procedure, it is kind of three steps, and the process is iterative. In other words, we're going to start by doing something to the first vector, v1, to make it belong to an orthonormal set by itself. Then we're going to use the result of that calculation to do something else with v2, to make it belong to an orthonormal set with the result of what we did to v1. And if we had a third vector, we would have to use the results of the first two to then determine what to do with the third. Um, luckily, here we just have two vectors to work with, so it's not going to be as long of a process as it otherwise might. Um, but the process comes in three steps. And the third step is the normalizing step which we get to skip directly to that step if we're just working with the first vector because we have no previous results uh, from V1 to actually use. So what we'll do is we'll take V1 and we'll just normalize it. We'll skip directly down to normalizing. And how do we normalize a vector? What does that computation look like? Divide by the square root of the dot product. Yeah, divide it by the square root of its dot product with itself. So we're going to change its length, which used to be 25. Actually, its length used to be 5. Its length squared used to be 25. And we're going to change it so that its new length is equal to 1. I'm going to call that new vector w1. And w1 is nothing more than v1 divided by the magnitude of v1, which, remember, by the magnitude of v1, what we mean is the square root of its dot product with itself. And a minute ago, we convinced ourselves that its dot product with itself was 25. So dividing v1 by the square root of 25, which is 5, will give us the vector w1, which would be what? Negative 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 0. And you can check, you should check, that the set which consists only of the vector w1 is an orthonormal set. Because every distinct pair of vectors in this set is orthogonal. There is no distinct pair at all to speak of, so that's vacuously true. And every vector inside of this set is a unit vector, which you can check now that if I take the dot product of w1 with itself, we will get 1. So this is a one vector orthonormal set that has the same span as the one vector set consisting only of v1 has. So, so far, so good. Well, that was the easy one. Now we need to do something with the vector v2, which not only remedies the fact that it is not perpendicular, orthogonal to v1, but also has to remedy the fact that it's not a unit vector. If I try to fix the normalization first, chances are I'm just going to have to refix it again after we do the orthogonal part of it. So in the Gram-Schmidt procedure, the orthogonality is usually what you fix first, and then you fix the magnitude second. And the two-step process to fix the orthogonality is project and subtract. After all, when we form a projection, um, what we end up getting, and we decided that this is what projection meant kind of on the first uh, week of the course, what we get if we project v2 onto v1, 
or equivalently, if we project it onto W1, what we get is something which is perpendicular, orthogonal, to, uh, to W1. So let's see. If I project V2 onto V1, I'm going to make sure I get this diagram reasonably accurate here. Uh, so this is going to be a right angle right here. And so here's my projection. I'll call it P. Uh, maybe I shouldn't call it P. Let me call it uh, R instead. So that's going to be my projection of V2 onto V1. And the reason we then subtract is because we're looking for the vector which goes from here to there, which goes from R to V2, because that vector is going to be perpendicular to V1, which is what we wanted. The projection itself is actually parallel to V1. It's a multiple of V1. But when we subtract the projection from V2, we get something which is perpendicular to V1, which is what we're looking for. So we have to do the projection step first. How am I going to project V2 onto V1? Or equivalently, it might actually be easier, how do I project V2 onto W1? How'd you do this step? Remember that when your basis is orthonormal, the projection matrix is as easy as A, A, B, C, or in our course, it's as easy as A, A, T. Okay. As easy as A, A, T. So why? Um, if you remember what happened in the videos, in general, when we make a projection matrix, we have this nasty formula, A times the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose. But the reason orthonormality is so awesome is that if the columns of A are orthonormal, then what do we get when we multiply A transpose A? One, well, one in the linear algebra sense, meaning what matrix? The identity matrix, yeah, exactly. So if the columns of A are orthonormal, then A transpose A is the identity matrix. And that's awesome, because there's no matrix in linear algebra that's easier to invert than the identity matrix. What's the inverse of the identity matrix? The identity matrix. And there's no matrix in linear algebra that's easier to multiply by than the identity matrix. What happens when you multiply by the identity matrix? Yeah, you just get, you know, it, it, it's a multiplicative identity. That's why we call it the identity matrix. So starting with an orthonormal basis for your subspace makes the projection matrix as easy as AAT. A times A transpose gives you the projection matrix. And in the case where our orthonormal set only has a single vector in it, that's this situation up here on the top, then the matrix A is nothing more than the matrix whose column is just this vector V, right? which means that my projection matrix, AAT, is going to be nothing more than V, VT. So, and this is the little shorthand rule of thumb for this, that if I want to find the projection of x onto a unit vector v, all I need to do is use vvt as my projection matrix. So I'll just multiply vvt by x, and I will have the projection of x onto v. <coughs> so that's awesome. And then likewise, if we just complete the thought down here, if I start with an orthonormal basis for a subspace, and I want to find the projection of x onto the span of that um, orthonormal basis, then the projection is just AAT times x. And again, this is great news because it doesn't require us to compute any matrix inverses in the process of finding a projection. And computing a matrix inverse is probably number one thing you want to avoid, um, not just if you're a student in linear algebra, but even if you're a supercomputer. Computing the inverse of a matrix is a very time-intensive and computationally intensive process. There's not a really good, efficient algorithm to do it as the matrices get bigger and bigger and bigger. So whatever we can do to avoid finding the inverse of a matrix is not only going to make your lives easier, um, but it'll also make it easier if you try to program a computer to do something like facial recognition or fitting a curve to a set of data or any of these applications that we're going to look at for all these ideas of projection. So projection is as easy as AAT when we choose an orthonormal basis for our subspace. So coming back to <coughs> All right, so based on all of that, we know how to project V2 onto W1. All we need to do is take W1, W1 transpose, and multiply it by V2. So W1 is 
negative three fifths, four fifths, zero. I suppose I should, sorry, I should make that a column vector. So negative three fifths, four fifths, zero. And then I have v, uh, W1 transpose, negative three fifths, four fifths, zero. And then I'm multiplying that by V2, and V2 was 1, 2, 2. So when I compute out this matrix product, I will get the projection of V2 onto W1. Um, because matrix multiplication is associative, I'm going to do this pair first <coughs> to make my life a little easier. Um, and when I do that product, I get negative 3 fifths times 1 um, plus 4 fifths times 2. That's going to be, what, 8 fifths minus 3 fifths? That's 5 fifths. Uh, and that's actually equal to 1. Interesting. Did I get that right? 4 times 2 minus 3, 5 fifths. Uh, yeah, OK. So that gives me 1. And so when I multiply 1 times that vector, I find that the projection is itself just equal to w1. That's a coincidence. I didn't plan it that way. <clears throat> Negative 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 0. And so that tells me the coordinates of this point right here. That point, which is the projection of V2 onto W1. But to find my orthogonal vector, what I need is to subtract that from V2 itself to give me this blue vector that goes from the projection to V2, which is guaranteed to be perpendicular, orthogonal to W1. So I'm just going to take V2, which was 1, 2, 2, and subtract negative 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 0. That's going to give me a vector which is orthogonal to w1. But because it's nothing more than a linear combination of the v1s and v2s, it still lies in the same span as v1 and v2 did. So 1, 2, 2 minus that is going to be 8 fifths, 6 fifths, 2. 8 fifths, 6 fifths, 2. I hope I have that right. We can check that if we take that and dot it with v1 that we should get 0. So it's orthogonal to v1. Um, and now all I have to do is normalize that, for which I would have to find its dot product with itself and divide by the square root of that. So uh, what would that give me? 8 fifths squared plus 6 fifths squared plus 2 squared. Oh gosh, 64 plus 36 is 100. Um, so 100 over 25 is 4 squared. 4 squared plus 2 squared. Uh, 16 plus 4 is 20, I think. And the square root of 20 would be uh, 2 times the square root of 5. And so I'll just divide that by 2 times the square root of 5. And I'll have my vector w2. <coughs> and I'm just going to cut a corner here by writing 1 over 2 square root of 5 times 8 fifths, 6 fifths, 2. And you can check now that W1, W2 form an orthonormal set whose span is the same as that of V1 and V2. <coughs>